Uh, we are, as usual, the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, and stop making that face, Weasel Walter. We're in the torrid edition. I am in a wonderful man cave of the highest order in New Kensington, Pennsylvania. We had an amazing show. Weasel broke six strings. It's a record. Sweated about two pounds off and everyone's fine. I will interrupt already. So for the listener, we are embarking on a tour that's going in the heart of darkness of <laughs> the, the new wave of infection based on all stats, just, just honestly speaking, um, of Delta virus. And I've been mass shamed multiple times. I've enjoyed the concerts. I have but, told a few unvaxxed um, people that I hope they die before the last song. It hasn't happened yet. But based on the obesity and the ignorance, and it is not condescending, it's actually just scientific. I would say, yeah, I don't think this looks very good. I think it's going to be pretty bad. Um, I have everything against unvaxxers who have had multiple vaccinations as children, which has allowed them to live as long as maybe they shouldn't have. Get a clue. Anyway. Well, they're going to find out the hard way. I have to say this with my opening piece, and I do trust what the scientists say in Geneva. More than 55 million people worldwide are living with dementia, a neurological disorder which, of course, robs people of their memory and costs the world $1.3 trillion a year. Now, the World Health Organization said population's aging, number of sufferers, Sufferers is projected to rise to 78 million by 2013, 139 million by 2050. And speaking of dementia, the Arizona Senate recently compiled with, complied with a court order to hand over the communications with the people involved in running the election audit, fraud, Trump bullshit, right? And Trump wanted to fund that audit, which I think is illegal. But it's also revealed how the effort attracted a number of conspiracy theorists one of them being Gail Golick, a realtor from Scottsdale, who gave up her job to spend all her time investigating claims about voter fraud. Now, she actually tried to call the FBI and the National Guard in because she said, oh, well, there are, we got to worry that there are possibly a threat from fire throwing clowns on the roof, set up maybe by Black Lives Matter or Antifa. The hiring of clowns, she said, as fire throwers is, of course, deeply concerning. Do not ignore this video. The FBI should look into it. There are no clowns at carnivals. I have to carry on with a little bit more about dementia. A priest who believes that demons and evil spirits have figured out how to send text messages and use them to taunt him and his team, amongst others. Now, Stephen Rossetti, 70, a licensed psychologist and counselor, said that demons are using text to taunt their victims, families, and any priest trying to save them. Now, he personally said he's experienced three instances of demon texting. I wish. And then on each occasion, they had targeted high-value people who were texted by the evilest of all demons. He believes this happens when he is due to perform an exorcism of which he performs up to 20 a week, and that the evil spirits are trying to put him off. Now, where do you think this ass clown works? Washington, D.C., and performs exorcism with his team. The issue of texting with a demon is covered nah. in the priest's new book called Diary of an American Exorcist. He's also been featured on Meet the Press and Larry King. No wonder Larry King died. Weasel brought up this good point because we're going through Western Pennsylvania, we're going through this giant farmland and you have this silo barn that has all over it, Trump really won and there's all these messages and then, and by the way, no socialism. And it's like, okay, wait, you're a farmer? You're not, so, you're, you're not in a socialism? You depend on socialism. You're growing corn. That is, that is in the federal budget to bail your motherfucker shit out. And, and so when I hang out, listen, I'm not even fucking mad about even- Mad cow. 
I'm not mad about right wing, insane capitalists. Uh, I don't care what your ideology is. What I get mad about is when motherfuckers don't even understand what they are. So, so if I go to a fucking bar in South Brooklyn of white guys, top bar, I'm like, you're the only socialist I know. You're all firemen. You're all cops. You're all public school teachers. I'm not even a socialist. I, I actually, I'm okay with it. I'm actually not even a socialist. You're the only socialist I know. You know, I tend to refer to police as sexualists. This is my diary definition. I tried to seduce one today in a restaurant. He was a little too young. Usually it's older cops that like to cry tears on my breast. He was a little too young. He said he was on a double shift. Tried to invite him into an adult cocktail. Maybe an adult scenario. Uh, it'd work. I see a man with a big stick in a uniform, boots, a gun, and a badge. I think it's pretty goddamn sexy. So as of today, and I don't want to get satanic, I do. 666,000 Americans have officially died from COVID. Have officially died. That, that surpasses even our greatest uh, casually uh, American death toll in all of our wars, which is the Civil War. Motherfuckers still want to be defiant. And guess who's defiant? The most nationalist people that want to pressure you into like sacrifice, country, freedom, you, you, freedom to kill. You, well, guess what? If the sacrifice, they sacrifice the country for four years to an evil flame talking clown. Maybe the Arizona real estate agent mistook the clowns on the carnival big top for just simple Trumpers. I'm not sure. So for the listeners, this the risk with us is we're heading into America and every night is Russian roulette because no one's wearing a fucking mask. And half the people are. The, well, the, it's not being checked. There's no fucking vaccination. I check protocol. my temperature about six times a day. It's always 96.8 because I'm a contrarian, never 98.6. There is a revolution happening in China, which I do feel I have to elucidate on. I don't know if you've heard yet, Simon, but I'm here to inform you of the lying flat movement. Yes, I do know about this and I like well, it. Well, I'm about to join it as soon as all the rest of my tours from now till the end of time happen. The lying flat movement is taking hold among young people in China and involves doing exactly what it suggests. Resting a lot, cultivating the most minimalistic lifestyle possible. And unlike Timothy Leary's 1960s mantra, turn on, tune in, drop out. Lying flat or Tang Ping takes no stance on a countercultural ethos or the consumption, unfortunately, of mind altering drugs. I do like to lie flat usually when I am on mind altering drugs, which is as often as possible. But it has caused the authorities, Chinese authorities, great alarm. And um, let's just put it this way. The Chinese government feel that is standing in the way of innovation and this cardinal sin against capitalism. One reason being it's, it's ringing alarm bells from Beijing. Now, the phenomena began where else? On social media. When 31-year-old former factory worker, worker Lao Haoseng drew the curtains and crawled into bed posted a picture of himself lying in bed to the Chinese website Baudu with the message, lying flat is justice. Lying flat is a state of exhaustion, a full body admission that the promises of capitalism are bullshit, that work hard now, rest hard later, have not and will not materialize. And that the truth is that for essential workers at the bottom, all the, they're never going to reach the top. They're at the bottom. Now, since this low housing has picked up tens of thousands of followers, the movement has become the target of censorship campaigns. Stop trying to stop the Chinese workers from checking out groups in a work culture that is nine, nine, six, 12 hours a day, six days a week. Rest may be the only form of resistance. So the hero of the Lying Flat movement, not Weasel Walter, he can barely stand still. His manifesto is the right to choose a slow lifestyle. And by doing little work, just reading, gardening, exercising, yes, lying down as often as you like. Now, to further elaborate, he wrote, lying flat is in reference to Diogenes. Diogenes. 
Who was the cynic? Diogenes, right, was the man, the Greek philosopher who was against Aristotle and Plato and decided to actually live in a fucking barrel, all right? He tried to demonstrate that wisdom and happiness belong to the man who is independent of society and that civilization is regressive. He scorned not only his family, I score everybody's family, sociopolitical organizations, property rights, reputation. He rejected normal ideas about human decency. He said to have, which was outrageous at the time, eaten in the marketplace, urinated on some people who insulted him, defecated in the theater. He sounds just like me. And masturbated uh-huh. in public. What do I always say? He coined the phrase citizen of the world. Now, there are some conflicting reports of Diogenes' death in Greek mythology. His contemporaries allege that he held his breath until he expired. Although others say, no, no, he became ill from eating raw octopus. Or he may have suffered an infected dog bite. But when he was asked how he wished to be buried, he said, I don't give a shit. Throw my body to the wild animals. And they said, well, should we leave you with a stick? He goes, I'll be dead. I don't fucking care. And I got to say, lying flat movement as a rebellion, it's not the worst that we can do. So, so, Weasel's doing it right now well, for about 10 minutes. Oh, I, 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 on a much, le- much less important it, uh, level, possibly. well, it was documented, Everglades Hick had a drone that was flying over the Everglades and the alligator ate it. That's uh, true. It, 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 Troll needed yeah, alligators. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It jumped Terrifying. out of the water. It was, he was flying it like just over and things like jumped up and just wolf the fucking thing down. I was so um, hungry earlier. I was going to eat an alligator that ate a drone. But, but going, going back to Hicks, <laughs> the QAnon shaman was sentenced to four years in prison. You know, he was crying because he didn't have his vegan meals in, in jail. And, and, and now he's going to jail for four years in federal prison. He's going to um, be awful sick of baloney, and I'm sick of his fucking baloney. Enough said. I have been mask shamed on this tour twice, only two days in. I'm not crying about it. But my response is, well, they're like, why are you wearing a mask? And my response is, your fucking breath in my face. Because, no, no, I go, because I want to. So, so, cause, cause they're coming with a, with a angle of like freedom. They don't let me wear a mask. I'm not telling them not to wear a mask, uh, uh, to wear one or not. one. They come to me for wearing one. Tim, the problem with you wearing a mask is it's not a full fucking burka with a hazmat suit. I, I'm going to be earnest about this. If we get sick, it's the end of this tour because suddenly we're going to other shows and we know about it and we're traveling and that's devastating to us. Yeah, but if it, we're vaxxed and I, we might not even know if no, we but, get but sick. It's, it's a shitty situation for us. We're all vaccinated that we're being shamed for going into a place to do our job and, um, and, and because, because motherfuckers aren't we're getting it, and then we have to be... I haven't noticed. If state. Tim's noticed he's being shamed, I don't even know what shame is, so I haven't noticed. I'm not worried about I that. I do what I, I fucking want. Stuck in a fucking, I don't want to be stuck in Indiana and have to quarantine for 14 days. That's why I don't want to... Do Should I get my there. digital thermometer and stick it up your ass right now? Oh, it's a forehead one. I forgot. Anyway, this is and has been and will forever be... <laughs> God, that is a tragic thought. The Lydia and Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, Weasel Risley hasn't, well, he's practicing the line flat move, but I don't blame him. And Simon Slater, our guest on this episode, whatever the fuck it is, is Byron Coley. This is the Lydia and Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, and Byron Coley. Byron, you wear so many hats, I don't know where to begin. I'll start by saying you might have met me before almost anybody did very early on. And we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. 
Byron Coley, best known for Forced Exposure, a million other articles in a million other magazines, feeding to records and record store, spoken word artist, poet, general, I'll say musicologist of the weird and wackiest things you can find, and promoter with his book with Thurston Moore of No Wave, at the very least of his accomplishments. Hello, Byron. Hello, Lydia. It's been a while. It has been, but you know, it's always nice to see. It's <laughs> been a while in more ways than one. Now, Byron, uh, my memory banks, silty and silky as they are, might be a bit uh, absent-minded on this, but I believe I first met you as you were tracking Eight Eyed Spy on tour. No, we met before then. Remind me. In uh, 1978, I believe it was, uh, Angela Yeager was working at Manic Panic. And uh, although I had met you one time before then, but uh, the thing is, Angela was working at Manic Panic. I was back on the West, on the East Coast for a brief period. There was that bar, that German bar right next to Manic Panic. Oh, yeah. I was sitting out there with Angela, her sister Hillary, and Annie Anxiety. And we were having, we were having a beer. And you came down the street. And Angela, who was friends of yours, was like, hey, Lydia, come on. So you sat down. In my memory of it, you sat down. You were like, yeah, what are you about? <laughs> <laughs> I had a beer in front of me and you knocked it over. Whoa. I don't like beer. Never did. Why did I do that? Because I was a young rascal. This seemed right. Flirting you know, with you. <laughs> I like this girl. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just like you were, you were kind of mean to me. It was good. Seven, I think 78. But uh, the eight eyed spy thing was a little bit later because Hillary had called me up. I was living in Idaho at the end of the 70s. Why wow. were you Whoa. living in Idaho? Wait a minute, why? I, met this, I was living in an SRO in San Francisco. And this friend of mine came out and said like, look, if you come to Idaho, I can introduce you to Mariel Hemingway. Oh, well, sparks will fly. <laughs> and he got me a job washing dishes. It, it took a while to meet Mariel. Anyway. But Hillary was like, I was living in Idaho and I was <laughs> on the phone. And she was like, you got to come. Like Lydia has like a rock band. And she's kind shocking of, at the time. She's like, <laughs> you aren't going to fucking believe it. So I was like, what do you mean? And she's like, no, you really got to come. So I was like, OK, so I like I quit my job and I split Idaho and I hitchhiked out to the West Coast back to the. And that was it. You mean back to the East Coast? No, back to the West Coast. I, I saw you in San Francisco. Ah. Like, like LA and San Francisco. That was it. So it was like, she was like, we're going out to the West Coast. You got to get out here. So I was like, okay, cool. You know. My least favorite band I've ever been in. I'm glad you liked it more than I did. You should have been the singer. George was a very good guy. And you and George in a band together. I have always thought was a really good combination. Yeah, you should have seen me and George in a bed together, honey. Ho -ho. Roar. Uh, well, usually he was standing up and holding me against the wall. Well, you know. Byron, I met you at the uh, Victoriaville Festival. I was, yeah. playing with, I was playing with Ava Mendoza. We we're both at the bar and I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you're kind of like, we we're talking about Lydia. I was like, oh, because I was new to Lydia's band. And basically you're like, what Lydia said in the beginning. I've known this person so long. <laughs> you know, I mean, I've known her before my son was born. And of course, then we also talked about Lydia's uh, interest in your son. Uh, hey, 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 hey. I am no, the no, godmother. In, in positive ways, in positive <laughs> ways. Not nothing in negative. She's my son's godmother. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I've never been able to, you know, bestow my godmotherly talents upon him. And now he doesn't need me. You never know that. I'm always there in spirit. I'm always there in spirit. Byron, what's interesting about you is your range of interest in so many different kinds of music. I mean, and 
one of the articles you sent me because you, you've written poetry books, you've written hundreds of articles. And I want to get back to the origins of that. But you send me because I asked you, can you just send me a few articles or something? And you sent me one on Raven, who I'd never heard about. But then again, your musical mastery of all things obscure obviously supersedes any interest I would even have in some, su such subjects. But I have to say this character called Raven with his, uh, what's the name of the album again? Return to Ohio Blues. Return to Ohio Blues, yeah. I have to say, it's so weird because it's a little bit glamish. He doesn't look it. The way that you describe him, his obscurity and now he's dead, but not knowing the musicians and he's going in to record the record. Uh, and also I read it when I, right after a piece that you wrote about going to see the Grateful Dead in 74, which I don't wish about anybody, but Raven was just another example and it is on YouTube. It's such a weird blend of music. I mean, it's almost a little bit glam, tiny, no, maybe just because it's, unprofessional yet it's weird it's catchy it's not really blues it doesn't really fit anywhere except within i guess the raven oof <laughs> uh fascinating to me yeah you know i mean the thing is like you know most the music that's really interesting always is music that is not really part of any genre it's just like nutty fucking people like who have to do something it's not like, you know, I mean, the thing is, there's there are a lot of people who think like music is a careerist, like fuck move. And so it's, stupid. <laughs> but people who do music because they have to do music, regardless of what it is. I mean, sometimes, obviously, it's horrible. But when it's good, man, it's really good, you know? Well, what it is, and we talk about this, I talk about it all the time. It's like, if it doesn't burn in, your, in the blood, stay in the garage and keep it there. If you don't have a vision, don't give it a sound. It's that simple. And it doesn't matter how weird the vision is, the weirder, the better often. And that's just, that's just the way it is. So you're going to rock concerts. You're, 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 um, you're kind of my age, a few years older, maybe, but you were already, uh, when you were living on the East Coast, you started, like I did, going to concerts very early. You started to go, what was your first concert? Do you remember? My first concert was the Left Bank <laughs> at uh, uh, the local high school. And I, it really went because a friend, of, like a friend of mine's older brother's band was opening. So it was like, I don't know, 67 or something like that. Although like where I lived was sort of the sticks. So if anything happened at the local high school, which meant, you know, you would go there. I mean, there was no, it just didn't really matter. It could have been anything. It could have been Bobby Sherman. But yeah, that was the, you know, it was, it was crazy though. It was like, we used to, when I was a kid, we would watch this friend of mine's older brother's band rehearse you know in their in the basement it is his his house you know they were called it's us they were originally called the orbitrons and then when the hippie thing happened they sort of like oh they switched to it's us and they had a volkswagen van called the us bus did they tour or was it just how they got to like local gigs they did not tour they were local their big gig was playing at a strip club in Buckley, new jersey called the baggy knees when they were even, I guess it must've been in high school then. I mean, there were so many bands like at that level then where, you know, nobody cared about anything, but it was cheap to put a record out. Or it was cheap to do something. Byron, you must have been greatly influenced as I was by a few things that are indicative of the expansion of our reality of more mainstream. I will not really, I don't consider Ellis Cooper at that time mainstream, but we had the luxury of so many interesting magazines like Cream, Rock Scene, uh, Circus at that time, Star Magazine, my favorite about underage groupies. But, and we also had Don Kirshner's Rock Concert, The Midnight Special. I had the house guitars. So that was exposing us because at that period, I'm talking like the early 70s, right. music was so weird. And even what was considered more mainstream was much weirder than it ever was after that. I mean, when you have Alice Cooper, New York Dolls, Mott the Hoople, et cetera, on, uh, you know, Friday and Saturday night rock shows. It right. was just spectacular for us. I was glad that in one of your, uh, the articles you said, you mentioned the New York Dolls 
I don't know if it was even in the Grateful Dead article. It might have been. I was glad you got the New York Dolls in there because they were absolutely influential. Although my music doesn't doesn't <laughs> have anything to do with them. Uh, boys dressing as girls, playing trash rock. I ran away. When the Dolls first came along, I mean, I was living in the suburbs outside of New York. You know, it was kind of known, but like there were bands around there that had been sort of like hippie rock bands that like all of a sudden like became glam rock bands. <laughs> like, funny. Overnight transition from, you know, like let's wear overalls and look like the Allman Brothers to like, man, we're going to paint our nails and make out with each other. Well, you know, not all glam rock was pretty. I mean, let's think about what was considered glam rock, like Slade, not exactly pretty, not even <laughs> really glam rock. Mott the Hoople, not really, and pretty freaking ugly. Sweet. sweet. Sweet, we're not good looking either, but <laughs> it's interesting what that the clothes kind of were what was partly defining what glam rock was. And it was great because it was a rebellion against the Allman Brothers, Black Oak, Arkansas, Leonard Skinner look, at least. At least it was a divergence from that look. And, you know, most girls at that time wanted to go to bed with guys that look like pretty girls. Do you ever see Teenage Lust? Oh, yeah, thanks. I had that album. <laughs> I had almost ever seen in my life. You know, there were some of those, like, some of those Coventry bands, those early, like, New York, like, even, like, 82 club bands. Those guys were hideous looking. And, <laughs> you know, but it was, like, so weird. It was kind of cool. It just didn't really matter, you know? I mean, like, I mean, for me, and I assume for you, too, it was just, like, weird, like, music that was, like, off- the beaten path, man. That was like interesting shit. You know, whether it was shout, you know, like you, you, you were in the Schaubrecht zone, you know? <laughs> I was, and I can't wait. And trust, so how many times did I beg them to be on a commercial? And finally, 40 years later, the son comes and films me on his iPhone. But when Retrovirus was playing in Rochester not that long ago, of course, I go back to the house guitars and there's the Schraubeck brothers going, ha, 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 as they always said when I'd go in there at 14. That's where you used to stand. I'm like, yeah, begging to be on the commercials. House of Guitars, still going strong, unbelievable. Very influential in that part of the country. Well, not only there, but like everybody I knew from Cleveland was like totally into that stuff. I mean, it's like there were all these weird places like New York, not so much. People in New York were into New York stuff, but like Rust, Rust Belt up there was like just insane with, with uh, just the rock and roll influence I had. Well, Detroit, Cleveland, Rochester. I mean, what else was there to do but rock or riot? <laughs> there wasn't much else going on besides like if there was crazy music, then you were into it because that's the only thing that was really going on, you know? Well, and everything came through Rochester, which is interesting because people are always like, oh, what was it like growing up there? I'm like, huh? I had a great time because I'd be going to concerts almost every weekend. It was amazing, you know, yeah. it was just great. And then we had the house guitar. So we had there were built in weirdos in in the in my neighborhood. <laughs> they just were weird. And that brings us to Byron Coley, one of the weirdest people I know, um, as far as the interest he has in music. Again, I want to go back to some of those early magazines because I'm going to admit that I think forced exposure is right in the same, le le probably beyond even what rock scene or circus was for us at that time, because it was so much thicker. It had so much more information. There were different writers. It was just so thick with information about so many things and such great writers. And I do say, and I will bow down to say, you know, Lester Bangs, who tried to get me in every article he wrote, thank him very much. Sorry, but Byron, you are kind of the inheritor to that, that throne. Uh, when, when Effie really started, when, when like, when, when I went back and started doing it more with Jimmy, there just wasn't any music, like decent music stuff going on then at all. You know, like, Cream had sort of, like, ended, which had always been the, like, 
you know, really the outpost of like crazy stuff. Um, they had really gone. It was still maybe it still existed at some point, but it was like it was crap. And there was just like there was nothing like that. And, and so our very specific idea was to do something in the cream tradition. With for, with forest exposure, right? You know, we got some of the people who'd written for him, like Meltzer and Greg Turner, and people like that. And I, but that had always been the most exciting kind of like stuff to read about. I, you know, like for a while it seemed like we, you know, we did a pretty good job of like sort of keeping that flag, that flag burning, <laughs> that freak flag. And the thing is, because it was pre-internet as well. I mean, it was really a very dense source of so much information because again, it was so loaded with so many different kinds of things, just different people reviewing. I mean, it was just really thick of content, which the other magazines that might've inspired us, they were always kind of skimpy. They had a lot of ads, they, you know, eh, they might've had a, a, a melt, they might've had a Lester Bangs, a Lenny K, a Meltzer, but yeah, they still kind of sucked for the most part, but it's what we had. Cream always, you know, had Rod Stewart on the cover or something. <laughs> they always had to sell it. With forced exposure, we didn't really have to like, we weren't worried about like selling it. Oh, Byron, let's face it. One of the best covers. Yours? Me, I have to say. Yeah, we did a shirt for that too. That was quite fetching. Well, let me just say that that hot, wet look dress my mother bought at a church sale for $1. Really? And and it's and it's the dress I wore when photos were taken of me at the House of Guitars. Well, I, I was met by a photographer at the House of Guitars. I was then taken to a graveyard to have photos taken in that dress, to which the the students at the Rochester Institute of Technology can get that satanic bitch off the wall for his taste of negative attention. That's the dress my mom got one dollar church sale. Well, your mom knew a good thing when she saw it. Well, she never saw me fill it out like that, and <laughs> lucky for her. Now, if my dad did, that's another story. We're not going into that punchline. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Hello. So you're going to cons. Go ahead, Tim. Sorry. What, what's interesting, though, and, and I'm younger than you guys, as you know, but just, just the cultural impact that at least popular music, even the underground popular music, but, you know, the cultural impact has clearly changed in terms of how youth reacts to this. One thing I, I was an observation, and I, I'll stick to it, is you know, a lot of people used to go to concerts, not just for the music. They went there to meet like-minded people that this band might represent, um, to get laid, to score drugs or whatever. And now with the internet, with laser precision, you can meet someone. You don't have to broach a weird conversation. You're already being hooked up before you know you're being hooked up. And so what's left are just the music fans. And it's kind of like, the music industry maybe didn't see it coming, but it's also kind of, oh, it's kind of quiet around here. So, um, <laughs> and of course, you know, we're diehards, or at least I am and you are, Byron. Uh, sometimes Lydia says she doesn't like music, but I don't know if that's true. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, but, um, <laughs> it and trust me, for the most part, I can live without it. I mean, I never <laughs> play it unless I'm playing it. But no, it's not that I don't. It's mostly I don't like the music you play, Tim. I mean, in your house, of course. I just nice, don't know nice, I'm nice. Not going back there. So, so I mean, with your profession and just your lifelong commitment to this, whether it's just professionally or as a fan, where's that? How do you feel right now in terms of just? You know, I mean, the thing is, it's true that, I mean, the function of music has changed a lot. When I was a kid. You know, music was a huge signifier. You know, if you liked a certain kind of music or whoever you hung out with, whatever kind of records you bought, you know, like that's what I'd do when I'd go over to somebody's house, you know, look at their records. That was that was a huge thing. It was like a Rorschach test almost. Look at somebody's record collection and see like, oh, this is like crap. Right, <laughs> or right, right. Old records or like, I don't even know what this shit is, man. This is like great. These were huge things when I was a kid. You know, as it, as it went along, I mean, the thing is, when I, was a, when I was a young kid, concerts were big things. They were mostly these huge things you went to. And then when I got a little bit older and I was like, when you started going to clubs, this was a totally different thing. It was like all of a sudden, it wasn't like big band, you weren't going to see the, 
you know, like the Stones or something like that. You were going to see this band that was like five or six levels below the Stones. But maybe we're like the Stones. Maybe they like the Stones or whatever. But like whatever, you see this stuff and it was completely different. And it was, it was like, that to me was so cool. And the thing is, and that was like pretty interesting, but it was still like there was a there was a disconnect between the people who were in the audience and the people who were on the stage. And the thing is, when punk sort of happened, all of a sudden there really wasn't, there was kind of a, it was kind of weird, you know, it was like you were all of a sudden like, oh, like the people on the stage weren't any different than you were anymore. It was like not like these people who had like, oh, we have got chops. We got all this stuff we can do. We want to play some tasty licks. Do all this like, you know, crap. It was like, oh, there's like people playing music that you can go and see. And it's like, they're just like some jokers that you know who just are like up on stage. Uh, Byron, I have to ask you because I'm obsessed and I can't even even Weasel Walter can't find much information on what was one of my favorite bands in New York around 77, 78. Manster. Manster. I know. It's like I've tr- I have tried. I know. Uh, uh, uh. All I can say is, ah, uh, yes, Manster. Like Thurston and I have tried to seek Manster information. My kind of band, but they played kind of weird hyper jazz or they had like some a few songs on the CBGB album, but like they covered a Yardbird song. I nobody can find them, but that was that you saw in No Manster that were obsessed. Yeah. Is, uh. No, it's like there's there are these, you know, the thing is there are these these bands that were like the thing is when I started going to CBs, there were all of a sudden like not all of the bands, but some of these bands were so fucking strange. I really was like, I didn't know what was going on, but it man, this is like what I wanted to hear more of. You know, well, and there was between bands like Manster could really play their instruments and they were pretty accomplished. Yeah, it was so freaking weird what they're saying and what their whole presentation is like. They just look like Long Island serial killers, which they maybe that's why we can't find them. And then there were people like Mars or myself that were just so abstract that yeah. with music that came from nowhere, uh, that was kind of the interesting thing. I mean, there were also bands that were trying to be more professional and it really sucked at that point. Like Blondie, they were just so terrible live at that point. You know, By- Byron, going back to what you're saying, it's interesting about just the tribalism that exists with a lot of these things. So as you're saying with like punk coming out, people look like you could relate to them and it wasn't these giant productions. Virtuosity was not uh, spotlighted. The big productions, the, the more uh, lo-fi thing was more highlighted seems like now with with corporate and commercial well what rocks even being put out but in general it's kind of the template of the punk but taking the worst of all worlds so there are no guitar solos but the but the people are average they just look like someone you'd see at walmart and but yet the production is huge it's kind of and and so then you'll see virtuosity in lo-fi underground shows it's basically like the tribalism still exists there are still bands that it's like i don't know why people think like this is what i really want to do for a job this is <laughs> and it's like man no it's not a fucking job it's like it's a mental condition if you it's, were- a, it's a sickness because if you think it's a job you better go work at mcdonald's you'll get paid more let's face it for <laughs> most people i was very happy the other night i was at this event and some gal came up to me and goes what do you, what advice do you have and i say this all the time to 22 year olds i said science chemistry or architecture and i was so glad she said i'm becoming an architect i'm like thank you i'm like don't think it's a career because it's such a fluke and really there's such there's a wider divide now than there ever has been on, which is not to say, look, go and do it. Just don't have these false, ridiculous expectations. And the problem is the internet has kind of made people think that, oh, yeah, I just need that many likes. I just need, I, I, you know what? Yeah. And good luck and go ahead. And who cares? You can have all the Lana Del Rey you freaking want. I really don't give a shit. If you think of like Teenage Jesus as a band, was not like, o- not often, but go ahead. <laughs> it was most horrible experience the first time i saw teenage jesus it was like what the fucking fuck is going on i mean it was just like 
I hate, this is horrible. This is just so horrible. And then you see it again, you're like, oh, this is supposed to be horrible. This is like what it is. And it, but it took, I mean, like to see a band like that. Excuse me. There are no bands like that, but go ahead. No, there were, I mean, like, no, but I'm, I'm like, what I'm talking about is like the no wave era. Like a lot of those bands were really like, so, I mean, like Mars was a little oh, bit. My, my favorite Mars, my favorite. Yeah. Musical, you know, in a way, okay. I mean, in like a, like a zombie sort of like incredibly like mutant way. They were sort of musical, but you know, if I think about you guys, or like band like DNA, like the er, like the really early DNA. That stuff was so like whacked out. To see those things, you'd be like, you'd really like if you try to like not just go with it, you'd just get a headache trying to figure out what it was. Hey, why do you think we only played for seven to thirteen minutes? And by the way, you think I'm very happy that forty years later people are like you know buying the rejects? I mean, give me a fucking break. Why ever you like it is because you're also insane. You like tantrumizing, and maybe I mean you know it's always Weasel that has to come back to me with, oh well, this guy just wrote a twenty page dissertation on your guitar playing, and I'm like ah. <laughs> You think there's a system and there might be, but it's the system of madness. And the thing is, it's it's the beauty about it is it was precise and it hated you more than you hated it. That was mm -hmm. teenage Jesus. Yeah, yeah, no, it's true. It's still hard for me to even describe what those shows were like, though, in a way. You, you were know? at them. I know, but like what people were like, people were so upset. At oh, the sad. So bummed out. It was great. How do you think I fucking felt? They were bummed out. What drove me to write that kind of shit? <laughs> you know, the thing is, though, what I'm always impressed is, is the fact that everybody liked the Dead Boys. I love the Dead Boys. Everybody liked the Dead Boys. Like, I can't, still can't get my head around that. Like, why? Well, look, okay. I'm going to say this. Sonic Reducer is just one of the greatest rock songs ever written. I mean, it's really up there to me. It is. But, like, everybody liked the Dead Boys, no matter what they did. Like, everybody was, like, into it. It was like you could be, the like, the biggest bozo or the hippest. <laughs> and people would just go to those Dead Boys shows. Well, you know the story of me and Stiv Bader's, Byron, that we met on St. Mark's Place before either of us lived in New York? Oh. And, we're, and we're pen pals from Cleveland to Rochester? <laughs> what? <laughs> Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> oh, that's true. And uh, and yes. And then one night when after we're both in New York and we we're at James Chance's house with this groupie shall remain unnamed. And it's and yes, me and most of the dead boys. And she's like, anybody can do anything to me, but not him, meaning James Chance. <laughs> <laughs> They're not the only ones that needed lunch. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. Pen pals. Can you friggin believe it? How bizarre is that? That I didn't yeah, know. Yeah, you can't know everything. Wow. So now, so you knew him before you met Miriam? Yeah, I met him on St. Mark's Place. It must have been when I was like 13 or 14 and first ran away because we were pen pals. That's great. He had an Iggy Pop t-shirt on and he looked like a little rat. I mean, who could resist? I mean, the thing is, when, I've, when I occasionally like flash back to that era, it's like everybody liked the Dead Boys. Like it didn't. Like, it didn't matter. Like, uh, you know, everybody who went to CBGB's always liked the Well, dead I mean, they were entertaining. They were rock and roll. There wasn't really anything that challenging about them. They were just dirty scumbags that were like sub Iggy Pop. And Iggy, by that point, was already over. So why not? There were a lot of guys who tried to writhe like that on stage. They didn't succeed. You know what band sounded the most like? This, in my opinion, like the Stooges, uh, because probably they had the parents' money to buy the right equipment, was Union Carbide Productions. So I saw it at CBGB's. I loved Union Carbide Productions. No, it's that was later. It was though. later, but, but they, they had the they had more the production sound somehow. I, I don't know. I really liked that group. I saw it at that CB show where they played. They were fucking amazing. Like them, it was like them and then Mud Honey after that were just like they really like nailed that like. That Stooges guitar oh, sound. So, good. so you, you first broke into quote unquote poetry from the Cleveland underground mid sixties. And then what made you 
I mean, then, you, you know, you worked with Thurston with ecstatic peace, poetry journals, uh, Xerox, crappy fanzines full of great content. But um, and then what I love is you eventually started doing spoken word. That is correct. Which I think, you know, you got a mouth like ours. You got to use it. <laughs> you know, it was just it was something that just sort of came along uh, as a uh, as an outgrowth of just doing it. I mean, I. I had never uh, been, I had really not really liked poetry very much. It just Who does? Yeah, it wasn't really my thing. And then I found these people who I like, oh, I thought, I thought they were really funny and just really weird and really kind of good. And it was like, oh, if you could do stuff like that, you know, why not? By, Byron, does that mean you do not con consider me a poet? I do. I do consider you. Don't insult me. Well... <laughs> But well, thank you. You have written poetry. I, I'm very poetic. My existence that's, is a is a poem on a the poem. stage. That's true. It's a it's living like poem. A, a living poem. <laughs> well, I prefer walking pornography, which Mike Chara <laughs> once insulted me with. But whatever. If I'm a cross between walking pornography and a living poem, I must be the hottest fucking thing not that nice. far out there. Oh, nice. It is. It's a it's 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 a vibrant cross. <laughs> I, I think that Thurston <laughs> is a really wonderful poet because he's very romantic and that kind of, you know, gets me a little moist. Yeah. You know, he, he's, he's kind of a sucker for that stuff. I, he, he's a little soppy, which means that he makes me a little soppy actually, whoa. but that's just cause I, you know, always had a thing for him. Not never more than when he finally broke through to the other side. It's just saying, uh -huh. right. Um, <laughs> Let's talk about too some of you. I mean, you have so many adventures as as we all do. But when did you start your record store, and what is that all about? And is it still going, or has that closed down? Is it only mail order during the pandemic? Oh, no, it's. I, I mean, I've been working in record stores off and on since 1969, which is since you were like 10. Yeah, I was like 12, 13. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was like it was a, one was at high school that that supported the radio station at school. So it was like from there, from there on, and it's like, it's just one of those sad things that I always kind of wanted to do, you know, work in record stores. I know, I don't know why. Well, but... that is really the loser's lounge of employment, and most most male musicians have either worked in video stores or record stores. Not Tim Dahl, of course. He worked at an ice cream stand, <laughs> <laughs> like Ricky to... Powell and Henry Rollins. That's <laughs> right. I mean, it's just. I, I, you know, the thing is when I have to try to admit that I wanted to like work in a record store, be like a radio DJ and write about rock music, it's so pathetic. I almost can't really say it out loud. Well, what would you have shot for hire considering who and what you really are? Well, you know, I could have been a hell of a shoe salesman. <laughs> oh, come on. Uh, I lived with one and trust me, he was a damn good artist. Really? Well, there you go. Yeah, but that's Byron, right. that's, I mean, that's but, what I with, could have been. But in a, in a record store, you're around records all the time now. You yeah, but, but wait, 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 though, Tim. Sorry to interrupt, but Byron, what are your favorite kinds of shoes on ladies' feet, may I ask? Ooh. You know, I haven't. The reason that I'm not a shoe salesman is I haven't really paid enough attention. You're, nice answer. <laughs> I mean, if you're not a shoe fetishist, get the fuck out of here. Whoa. Stick to the record stores, Whoa. honey. I know, I you're, know. It's, you're, it's... you're a record fetishist. Sorry to interrupt him. Go ahead. Had to get it in there. What, all, what about vinyl shoes? You could kind of bring them both together. Woo! That's true. <laughs> uh, Tim, that would be patent leather. Here is another non-expert in well, shoe Well, oh, I, I know what patent leather is, but anyhow. Yeah, yeah right. and have you tasted mine? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but I let others Not do that. that. I'm a voyeur. I'm a voyeur. I'll let others do it. Hey, hey, hey. You've been in my closet once or twice. Well, listen, <laughs> I, the, the only licking I'm involved with is the ice cream stand. But anyhow. Um, <laughs> All right. Sure, wow. Tim. No, yeah. so, okay. so, I mean, honestly, you're, you, you know, you think it's pathetic, but you like, you love music. So you're around records all the time. It seems like a legitimate uh, job to feed your yeah, hunger. You know, I mean, it, it, it is in a way. But it's, did, you, uh, did you ever work at a crappy record store, like one that sold just like banal, just commercial shit, nothing that you'd be? I did. I did yeah, when I lived in San Francisco for a while in the '70s, I worked for a, a, a chain of record stores. Okay. That was really pretty bad, but you know, it was just like, uh, 
He was I, the- I'm cutting. I'm cutting in, Byron, because it's not pathetic when you are crafty enough to turn your fetish or your obsession into something that is a lifelong, I hate to say the word career, but a path that you are going to pursue to the nth degree. Not everybody can do that. People might have obsessions. They might have fetishes, but best of all, keep it in the fucking garage. You actually expanded beyond that. And that is something that is not pathetic. Although, you know, you could have been a shoe salesman or a gynecologist, but or an architect or a chemist. But I'm just saying, as I manspread and mansplain, it's possible. It's There's true. Still time. It's- it's, you know, the thing is, the uh, in terms of the people who are writers, you know, the lowest really writing is like is like rock music writing, generally. I mean, I think it's really... Wait, 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 kind of- oh, I, can I, I'm going to have to rephrase that for you. Some people that write really lowly write about the lowest rock music. Other people that are geniuses in the field, like yourself, Lester Bangs, very few others, write about all kinds of things to, in order to expose people to that, which they might not know. So I'm sorry. I have to, I beg I mean, you differ a little. What bit. about movie writing? I mean, that seems like that's lower movie writing. Well, you know, I mean, the thing is writing about uh, what, you know, popular culture. And the thing is there, you know, it, it's like, it's people think of it as very disposable, any kind of anything like along those lines. So that people have a really hard time understanding why anybody would take this stuff more seriously than they do. Well, I, I don't have a hard time because I like reading reviews about things. I re- I like reading reviews about everything. I mean, yeah, from fucking lipstick to a horror movie. I was just reading reviews of about 12 horror movies today sent because I was investigating Dragula, my favorite obsessive binge watching show now about horror drag and it led me to a horror site i love right reading reviews and also wrote a few reviews which still affect people thank you very much they were in forced exposure to this day i have to i say i love reviews i love when people write them i mean even on something like imdb i always read i mean i'll at least skim through the reviews it's of course i don't care who's writing it but when i see something that's written with really in-depth understanding it does matter to me yeah. Well, that's good. That's that was incredible. my review on reviews. Um, my review on reviews is I will still, I might not like everything that Byron likes, but I really like reading his reviews, even if I don't like the subject matter. So I'm just going to elevate what you consider a pathetic well, loser of a life to really the status I see you at, which is really a valuable part of the counterculture. Right. Hats oh. off. Okay, well, thanks. Well, you know, also, Byron, you, 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 yesterday you kept on speaking about like, well, why, going into music for a profession, you, you just do it. It just burns in you. And that's kind of what you do. I mean, as we're all in this kind of like shrinking island, I mean, you, I mean, fucking a record store and journalism in general. I mean, everyone on social media is a critic now. And then now, I mean, record stores, I mean, people are just releasing shit for- But, but hence, why, how, hence why real- critics not critics but real reviewers are mandatory now because everybody is a like or dislike oh fuck you cancel yourself will you i mean real reviews are more necessary now than ever in the time of remote controlled imaginations that's just what i think no fuck, I, I, fuck I, me I, if you disagree no I, I agree that that's true i think that it's 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 a much smaller portion of people now though that are that like actually pay attention, know what know what good is even. Yeah, but I mean, does that ever matter to us in the first place? Did we think that there was a vast majority, like a populace we were trying to preach to? I've always preached to the perverted. I don't care. I mean, is it really smaller or is it just more the elitist? And I mean, elite, not in a snobbish way, but in a very specific way. Yeah, it's, it's pretty, it's really hard. It's hard to say. I don't, I honestly don't really know. It's a, uh, you know, I found that the uh, the proliferation of electronic media and all the the sort of social networking stuff that goes with it has created a like a whole group of people who think that they're critics and think that they're writers and they really kind of aren't. Byron, do you do social media? Because I fucking don't. Other than the podcast, I don't look. At, if I looked at any of my friends' writings, I would fucking disown them immediately. The, I do one. I do this. I do Twitter because you don't have to answer stuff and they're very short. Have so you seen my tw- have you seen my twatter? 
Because it's not out there. Whoa. Oh. <laughs> but that's about it. You know, I have no, I've, no, I haven't really indulged in any of the other stuff. As you a rock time, critic, you're too, you're too busy doing other shit. Sorry to interrupt, a, Tim. Go ahead. As a rock critic, how, yeah, what do you think of Charlie Watts died today? That was kind of a Whoa! A, a big uh, rock and roll name to. Yeah, you work. know, he's eighty. You know, yeah, he's like, I've, yeah. I, you I mean, j- j- I, you know, he always seemed like he was. Uh, I, I would I would have expected others to go before him. I, I thought he way. was. I thought he always was kind of dead. He did have that cadaverous look, but it was a he was a well dressed cadaver. He always had that sort of effect. So Byron, but Byron, in these times, do you do you find and and you are someone that you know, you you go beyond the present and into the past, and you, you're really an underground detective of alternative culture and music. But what what I always say to people is. Especially people in their 20s complain, oh, there are no visionaries now. I'm like, look, not everything happens right now. There's so much literature and music that has happened before. What does it matter when it was created? Does it speak to you? So d- does it make you more diligent now in this time of like really bad? I mean, hardly, I mean, crap. Yeah, I mean, it really does. It makes, I mean, it makes me more interested in trying to get people to understand some of the shit that's been out there that's just sort of overlooked whether it's you know it's music or or you know movies or or writing or you know like any of that stuff there's there's so much incredible material that exists most of which was really never popular at all some of which was barely distributed you know it was like you know these total freaks who could barely like get you know send a letter you know back in the day and that's well, and it, that's why we count on you so that's why yeah. you to me are are very important in the scheme of things and that's why we do this podcast because we do try to dig out or just get people's opinion about what's going on how they do it what's out there i mean there are people that want to know and to me it's always a cyclical thing and uh, I mean, you know, I feel like I've crabbed walked entirely sideways through my own career. I'm just happy to do what I do because it doesn't, I've always, and you too, we're speaking to and for a sexual, intellectual, political minority. They're always going to be there. It's true. I mean, I, I guess, I mean, the, it's funny because I've had, there have been periods where I had, you know, like a bigger forum. There was like, you know, I was doing spin for a while. I did the underground column in there. And that was like, you know, it's such a mixed thing for something like that because it was kind of a horrible place to do work. But on the other hand, then, you could write about this stuff that a kid could be in a drugstore in Iowa and they could get this magazine and they could read about, like, you or this, like, just weird stuff. Well, would... Byron, they didn't cover me that much. And as a matter of fact, they gave me a kill fee, fee for two of my articles. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Carry on. <laughs> but, you know, to me, that's interesting is to get stuff to people who, you know couldn't had no access to it and and that's and that's why the internet is important or youtube and that's why putting our stuff on the internet is important it's true it's true but for free even it's true it's true but i still don't think that there are enough that people pointing at the exact like giving people enough good advice about where to look for stuff that's, well, that's the thing, real hard. That's the the hard thing is, there's so many fucking people. Like, how many people do actually want knowing what you do? This is a question I don't have to ask myself because you know what? The people that I respect understand what I'm doing to a certain degree. I don't really fucking care about anybody else. I'm not trying to expand anything here. I never have been. So that there, I'm always trying to speak to the individual, whoever or wherever they are. That's enough for me. Now I'm going to tell you about what spin killed. All right. I'm on a plane. Somebody's wearing a rap a lot t-shirt. I'm like, rap a lot. Do you work for rap? First of all, are you married? Oh, give me a break. I'm married many times, not to you. Uh, do you work for rap a lot? Yes, I do. I want to interview Scarface. Okay. Spin, send me to Scarface. They do. Houston, me and Vanessa Scon say the only wh- only white women or people at a rap a lot presentation. I interview Scarface. Within one minute of being in the car, he pulls out his Gat, we're being followed. I'm like, uh huh. He takes me to his hood, <laughs> better neighborhood than I grew up in. Anyway, uh, I said, don't touch my electronics. He did. It died. Spin did not want to print the article because I had to quote Scarface's lyrics, which were all good at that time. Anyway, uh, Road Warriors. 
I went to Nashville to interview the Road Warriors, my favorite wrestling team, who stole my outfit from the Queen of Siam, tasted the blood of the Steiners. Main point was a lot of fakes and rock. Why are you questioning wrestling? They said it was too violent. Kill fee again. That was spin. All right. I did the Pat Benatar. Who cares? I'm saying. Oh, that's right. You did that. I forgot. About I that. have the slides of me and the Road Warriors. <laughs> did, did, were you approached about the Pat Benatar or did you pitch the Pat Benatar? I did not pitch it. I don't, I don't know. Even know how, I don't know either how it came about. <laughs> road yeah, Warriors. The first line was look up the word pain in the dictionary. You'll see a picture of the Road Warriors. What rocker has ever had their cheekbone busted or can deadlift 300 pounds? Give me a fucking break. I'm just saying many fakes in the rock arena. Hello. Yeah, well, you know, spin the gooch. You know, those guys were just like, they were bad news. Yeah, all those, they all sucked. They did. I liked his that that sort of like hoity British accent he had, though. He would like he'd like bust in on the phone on me when I'd be talking to the editor and go, "Oh man, really capital, capital." I'd be like, "What? Like what who the, is that? Huh? <laughs> yeah." Ah, like, uh, you know what, but By- Byron, what's on your mind now? What what's What's drawing you in, whether it's a book, a record, a TV show, a movie? Where, where is, where's your mind at right now? Oh, you know, I'm just, I'm always working on projects, you know. We've got, we sort of do this label stuff, and we've been, you know, we kind of put out a record a week. Can you be a little more specific? I this label stuff. How do you even find a freaking record a week? Jesus. Well, you know, you just, you just look, and there they are. <laughs> but it's a label feeding tube, so we do that. I mean, i just been... You know, I do that with this other guy up here, Ted Lee, and uh, we do a bunch of different things on that. And, you know, well, what's the weirdest, most favorite thing you've just put out on feeding tube? Um, the weirdest thing we just put out on feeding. No, tube the weirdest thing, thing that you really like. Yeah, it just came out today as a is a split LP between orchid spangiophora and the glands of external secretion. Nobody knows what that is. So please explain. You know, it's like a, it's tape music. Um, one of the guys is this guy that I used to do, you know, like music concrete stuff that I used to do with him when we were in college. And we put out an album back in the 70s called Orchid Spangiophora Flea Past's Ape Elf. And, uh, you know. I, I you just... wonder why your audience is still limited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. And then, uh, you know, Thurston and, and Matt Gustafson and I just finished a book on... Uh, Free do jazz. tell, do tell. Wait, wait, wait. Free jazz. So you each, what, you what, each what wrote pe- a section wait, of the yeah, book? Yeah, what period free jazz? 1960 okay. to 1980. Oh, okay, cool. Who's in it? Are you... Oh, you know, a lot no, of people. No, I don't. That's why I'm asking. Well, it's like it's it's record specific. It's like the 100 okay. best free jazz albums from 1960. Ah. What's number one? Uh, Albert Eiler's Spiritual Unity. Hello. Where's what free about... jazz? The album free jazz. Where's that in the... Uh, uh, we put them in... They're, they go in chronologically. So, oh, okay, okay, okay. But, what's so, number 100? <laughs> what's number 100 is, uh, I think, the first Borbetta Magus album. Hey. Uh, okay. <laughs> how, how, many, how many Cecil Taylor records are in that? Uh, we're, we kept it to only one per liter. So Whoa. We Whoa, so, okay. Yeah. So which, which Coltrane one did you pick? Uh, Meditations. So... <laughs> Are none of my records in there? I mean, it's not really free jazz, it's free jizz, but I'm sorry. It's, it's another genre altogether. We were going to do a free jizz book after this. You are that was, not. That was good. This was the lead up to the free jizz explosion. And who, who, you, who are you interviewing besides me? Well, we're starting with you and then just whoever you tell us to interview. We'll Nobody. Go. It would just be me, 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 and you, and then Thurston, <laughs> and it'll just be a splooge of information. Wow. Well, you know, that's sometimes... Information travels in those kind of packets. Well, but, I think we should just keep that one to our own personal, you know, right. speaking of obscurity, maybe one, or maybe three copies only. Right. That sounds good. I like that stuff. I like it too. Hey, so I'm, an, I'm, an, I'm an obscurist. So we did that free jazz book. I did a cookbook this year. Well, uh, wait a minute. When when does the free jazz book coming out and what's it called? The free jazz book. We haven't really, the title has been changing around. It's, we're still just getting the illustrations together. All the text is done. It's going to be coming out in England either the end of this year or the beginning of How about of Out of Your Own Mind? Out of Your Own Mind. That's kind of a good title. It is a good title. I'll give it to you. Go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, that could be. That could be. I- wait, wait, wait. No, cookbook. You know I released a cookbook. So I mean, I know you released a cookbook. I don't know why we've never cooked together. This is ridiculous. That's true. We should. 
We should meet in New Orleans. We can go now. Hud, my son, Hud lives down in New Orleans now. I mean, he's Just, like, how old is he? He's thirty-two. My godson is thirty-two. Yeah, yeah. Jesus Christ, does he have a child? No. Good. <laughs> no, but he, he he likes to cook though. He bought a house down there, so. Does he have room for me? I don't know. I'm his godmother. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Payback is a bitch. What can I say? <laughs> But, Byron, uh, what is your favorite thing to cook? And what are you cooking for me next? I'll be up. Well, you know, I've been, like in this type of weather, I do a lot of barbecue stuff. Nice. Um, you have Tim, a is an, Tim is an expert I do, barbecue. I do have a so, smoker. What, what's like your a, specialty? Like uh, brisket, ribs? Uh, um, Brisket, man, is really hard. To that's do. a hard one. That's like the I mean, real test, right? I mean, yeah, it's, it's really hard to do right. I, never, I don't really have the patience to do that. You know, you like, two meat men should get together and have a grill <laughs> off. Well, we, grill, grilling's different than barbecue, according to some snobs. It is. They are yeah, different, yeah, yeah. but they're yeah. they're related. Yes, they are. Um, I mean, the thing that I really do a lot, and my favorite thing, is to do a bacon explosion. Okay, explain. Uh, uh, wait, 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 wait. What? A <laughs> bacon explosion. I mean, bacon meaning the meat candy of the universe? Yeah, it's like you make a big mat of bacon, right? Okay. And then you get some pork uh, sausage. You roll it out on it. You put cooked bacon inside of it, and then you Whoa. roll it back up. And that then you intense. smoke, you wrap it up, and you smoke it, and it's like... Byron, I mean, slices, it's Byron, really uh, hold, hold on. You're rather <laughs> trim for for espousing the delights of, of that. Uh, I'm just saying, I'm into the tagine now. Oh, really? Trust, trust Tim has eaten my tagine, and it right. was yes. damn, damn delicious. Oh, yeah. Very tasty. Tagine's a good, that's a... That's a, a lot of flavor. Be, I know, you really have to be slow cooking those things and, well actually no time. you're wrong actually you no? can cook something in 20 minutes you know really oh. slow oh, well i like, like a 20 a minute meal tag, and actually use an actual tagine to i have an actual tagine i uh -huh. do it cooks very quickly using very little uh -huh. water but i like really spicy I mean, you know, whatever yeah. meat or uh, bacon is not doesn't really cross my lip i might lick it but i don't need spare it spare ribs or uh baby backs what do you tend to side with <sighs> You know, I like I like spare ribs, but you got to really cook them the right way. Yeah, cook them the right way. There, there's more. There's more on it. So there is. Right. Yeah, there is. You know, I got a bit of brisket. I wouldn't mind contributing to your fucking grill right about now. But all that's all I'm saying. So I don't know how we've gone from poetry to well, poking at the meat grill. It is all connected. Hey, there's real poetry in knowing how to grill right. Tim is an expert. Byron, an expert in barbecuing, I'll take over the tagine. I think we've got, you know, a cooking show that will never happen is all I'm saying. I think it would be good, though. I do. I do not. You know, I could direct. But, <laughs> I mean, look, if I cook for you, it's a private thing because you are going to be eating my DNA, motherfucker. You know it. How do you why do you think everybody loves me? They are. They all ate parts of me. Some part. All right. I don't think there's any much more to go on with this. All I know is. Byron Coley is an underground alternative detective of obscure shit, musical, poetic, intellectual. He produces records. He does spoken word. He does reviews. He's written for everybody. He's been around almost and maybe even longer than I have. He's a good friend of mine. He's a true classic weirdo of obscurity and i am so glad to have you on this show and so glad to know you and by the way the no wave book you did with thurston was pretty freaking fantastic thanks man that was uh yeah it was good it was good to do and your intro was uh was uh, the icing on the cake well i always love love letters to myself face and i write them every day but this is the lydian spin with lydia launch tim darling Byron Coley. I'll Byron, you, sh you should uh, come visit us in Miami this weekend if you can get out of the house. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Miami. Yeah. I don't think so. Yeah, right. I don't think so. Oh, hey, uh, retrovirus, September 22nd, St. Vitus, Brooklyn. Maybe you can make that one. You never yeah, know. And this is the Lydian spin. Lydia lunch. Jim Dahl. Byron Coley. Nothing more need be said. Thank you, Byron. Thank you. Bye. See you All soon, right. I hope. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.